This is Women's Tech Radio, Episode 6. A show on the Jupiter Broadcasting Network interviewing interesting women in technology, exploring their roles and how they are successful in technology careers. And today, for our little tidbit about ourselves, I would like to talk about our early experiences with chat rooms. Oh, chat rooms. Mm -hmm. My first experience in chat rooms would totally have been AOL chat rooms. Mine too. Yeah, I totally was a giant nerd and would go in and talk about Dungeons and Dragons. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah, you're a gianter nerd than me. <laughs> yeah, I'm a pretty giant nerd. Yeah, I just went in there to just talk to people randomly. One time I pretended I was pregnant, but I uh, they asked how far along I was and I calculated three weeks in the month instead of four and sort of like, uh, no, and they totally, totally caught me. Oh, that's sad. Yeah, it was really interesting though. Like, the, the, I was right at that age where AOL chat rooms had just come up and like, but you could just anonymously chat to someone mm-hmm. like all over the world through my dial-up connection yep yeah i know right yeah you had to add that in there the dial-up yeah it was uh pretty much the summer of 1998 for me is when i really got into the aol chat rooms but i used it a lot to talk to chris actually oh mm-hmm. that's adorable not, not in 1998 well probably the next year wow yeah it was about 96 for me so today we interview Erin Clark. She's a system administrator with iX Systems. And before we get to that, I'd like to talk about DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server. Yeah, I use DigitalOcean every day as my dev box. I just keep it up on the cloud, test things out, and then if I break things, it's a super simple, pretty much one-click install, backup, and ready to go. And it's pretty affordable as well. It's super affordable. Users can create a cloud server in less than a minute, and it really is only $5 a month for 512 megabytes of RAM, 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and one terabyte transfer. If you would like to support the Women's Tech Radio, you can use the code WTRDECEMBER to get a $10 credit, which is two months of service. And DigitalOcean has data center locations near you in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, and London. So no matter where you're at, there's pretty much a server nearby. The interface has a simple intuitive control panel, which power users can replicate on a larger scale with the company's straightforward API. Awesome. And we get started with Erin today by asking her what she's doing in technology now. So what I do right now in technology, um, I am a system administrator for iX Systems. Uh, I manage their servers. I keep everything working here at the office. Um, I also do a little bit of development on the side. I work on the the FreeNAS project. I've been uh, committing some fixes to that. I've been in technology for several years. I Before this, I was working as a, a desktop technician at uh, Truman State University which is also where I went to college and got my uh, computer science degree. I love system administration, but I think a lot of people kind of get scared by it. Like people are like, oh, I'll be a developer because it's easy. And like, but they see sysadmin, sysadmin is like more of a entry level position or they're like, oh, it's too hard because it's with the hardware. Like, how did you get into that? Like, how did you tackle that? It, it was a bit scary for me at first, I, w- I will admit. Um, working on live hardware does have its... Um, it has its risks. You you're you gotta make you gotta make sure everything's still working at the end of the day. So that um, so I, I was pretty scared at first, but as I've as I've gotten used to working on it, it's you know you you get to know what you're what to expect, and you just you get used to you get used to that fear level, and you know you just learn to handle it. And it's not so much that you stop being afraid; it's more just kind of like the Hulk. You're just always angry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And you do development too um, with the FreeNAS project. Can you can you talk a little bit about FreeNAS? I think it's a really cool project. It's our in-house um, open source project. Um, it is a uh, it is a FreeBSD based file server appliance. Um, you, it is uh, it uses it takes advantage of FreeBSD's uh, support of the ZFS file system. Uh, FreeNAS has several plugins for it. You know you can you can run a Plex server on it, and you can. Um, you can run VMs using uh, VirtualBox. Oh, that's cool. I didn't it, know that part. That's awesome. It, it's really, yeah, it's really cool. And um, you can also connect it to it. It has all kinds of um, enterprise network capabilities. You can connect it to your Active Directory. It has NFS, Samba, and um, Apple networking capabilities. It's it's just an all around great file system appliance file server appliance no kidding so you're uh, doing some development work with them you're you're working on the code base i've i fixed a few things in the gui um i also fixed a um some an error message that was popping up that was completely useless in um 
when you plugged in USB devices that it didn't recognize. Uh, I'm slowly getting more into the development uh, process of FreeNAS and look forward to doing even more development on it. I've I've heard a lot of people like talk about open source, but like, um, what is it that like makes you? I think it's something that's really unique to the tech field that we kind of have this culture. But like, what is it that makes you want to essentially kind of do work for free to like to do this give back? Like, where does that? Like, I've always been curious of where that drive comes from from technicians. Well, I've I've personally been a um, I've used open source for several years. Um, I've used Linux for probably eight or nine years. Um, I started using FreeBSD about five or six years ago. Um, I like it because it's, you know, it's, for one thing, it's free, so you don't have to, you don't have to pay anything for it. And um, uh, it, it also, I feel like it's more secure and stable just because, you know, if, if, you, if you have a problem with this open source project, you can go in and fix a problem yourself if you want to. Um, I like the I like the idea of developing for open source because it's it's kind of a way to give back to the community in sorts. So you know you're using this free product, but there's several other people that are using this free product as well. Mm -hmm. And when you when you make commits to an open source project, you're you're giving back to this community that you're a part of by using this product. Yeah, so it's, it's that value. Like you're getting so much value out of it, it almost seems silly not to give back. Well, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I was just thinking, like, like where do you where do you find most of your um, learning and education coming from? It probably is community based, I imagine. Definitely. Um, I, you know, I a lot of the um, a lot of my research is just spent on you know Google. So I find uh, stuff that other people have put up on the internet that you know says you know where they encountered this problem and. They, they figured out a way to fix it. I've also, you know, a lot of learning comes from just tearing at the guts of this open source project you're working on. So, you know, the more you, the more you dig into it, the better you know this thing and the more you can, you know, the better you can use it or fix it or whatever. Yeah. Understanding how something is put together is, is really valuable. Is your forward momentum like you'd like to transition to be a developer from a sysadmin or...? Um, that is kind of the goal. Um, I, I do like I do like managing servers. I have a passion for working with open source Unix, um, but I also um, I do like development. Um, I you know my degree was in computer science. I have a passion for programming. I think getting involved in open source too is a great way to have that like transition, even if even if it's not really formal or you don't have the formal computer science degree. It seems like a great stepping stone. Do you have any great stories from when you were a desktop technician? So I, I worked on a, a large range of clients' uh, computers. Some of them were really nice people. They would, you know, they they were really patient with you. They would, you know, they would sometimes even feed you if you fix their computer. Wow. You know, some people have really clean, nice to work on computers. Others not so much. I've definitely opened up some hair factories in my day. Oh yeah, I, I opened up this one computer where there was so much dust on the computer fan that it, you know, it looked like the thing was made of dust. You couldn't even see the computer <laughs> fan itself. Yeah, Antiquated. <laughs> yeah, I've opened up a few uh, writers' computers who were also, you know, many oh. years ago, and they are smokers. Ew. That is the, that is mm -hmm. the worst. That is the worst. I, I've worked on those too. You also you also deal with a lot of you dealt with a lot of viruses because it's, you know. A desktop technician, you often work in Windows computers, and that's another thing I like about open source is there's not so many. Um, you don't deal with viruses not nearly as much. Right, or, it's not the primary reason to get your computer fixed. <laughs> like that, what is probably like the hardest part of what you do right now? I'd say the hardest part is figure is when you're trying to you're trying to figure out something wrong with a server that might actually be a network issue. There's so many layers of complexity involved that you you have to really dig deep down and trace every little every path of where this you know the communication from the server to the client happens well, i love system administration you clearly have a passion for it what would you say to someone like who's interested in getting started with system administration like what what should they do where should they go or like what kind of attitudes should they bring to the table 
So you're definitely going to want to know a lot about both networking hardware and software. So you're going to want to, you know, learn some, learn some Cisco, maybe, you know, just learn about the types of network hardware that's out there. There's, um, you, you want to familiarize with yourself with the different types of server operating systems out there. So, you know, you want to, you want to know, you want to know a little bit of Windows, you want to know a little bit of Unix, you want to know a little bit of Linux, learn how the TCP IP stack works. I would have not really thought about how vast that knowledge base really is. That's, that's huge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Right. It seems very tackleable. I like, I, I wouldn't have really thought to recommend like looking at network hardware. Like that's a piece of the puzzle that like my brain doesn't think of easily that's a great recommendation this has been great um i just had one more thing to ask you i always like to to know like what people are most excited about in technology right now like what's coming or what's happening now like what what about the future makes you like jazzed i'm actually really excited um for just the open source world in general um i've i've seen open source unix come from you know this thing that's barely usable that you know, kind of works like a modern operating system to something that um, I just ran Netflix on uh, Chrome and native Linux yes yesterday. Nice. And that was pretty exciting because before then I was using a virtual machine running Windows XP to do that. And it's, you know, Linux has also made its way into your, your phone. You know, it runs on your Android. Uh, FreeBSD is also making some good strides with FreeNAS and other networking appliances. So I'd say it's, it's a pretty exciting time for open source and computing in general. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Aaron. This has been fantastic. We'll talk to you soon. If you would like to be on Women's Tech Radio, you can email us at wtr at jupiterbroadcasting.com or you can go to the contact form on jupiterbroadcasting.com. You can also hit us up on Twitter at heywtr. And soon, or if not already, we will be in the iTunes store and you can subscribe to the RSS feed.